So no, I'm, I'm, again, I'm excited about our next presenter. Um, I've known Nathan for a lot of years, and, and I'll give you a personal story before I give you the official story. Um, and, and don't worry, it's not that story. It's a different story. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the Healthcare Coalition was lucky enough to go down to New Orleans to participate in the National Healthcare Coalition. And, and as you'll see, Nate was from down there. He's got a lot of experience down there. And he got a lot of us Northwesterners to eat alligator for the first time. And he just kept saying, oh, it tastes like chicken. Trust me. Uh, but when we did, and it was, it was okay, um, but it was just interesting to see a bunch of Northwesterners trying alligator for their very first time and to see the hesitancy and the, and the do I really want to do this? Uh, Nathan Weed is currently serves as the Deputy of Emergency Operations for the Washington State Department of Health, Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. He has been with the Department of Health since 2012. Prior to working with the Department of Health, Nathan served as the Emergency Response Program Coordinator for Clark County Public Health in southwestern Washington. Uh, he found his way to Washington in 2006 from the state of Louisiana, Office of Public Health as a bioterrorism epidemiologist. He has a master's in public health, community health sciences from Tulane University. So there it kind of gives you his roots. He's here now. Um, and he's going to share for us um, his experiences in, in working in the ESF-8 functions uh, through some response activities. All right. Thanks, Ed. Hopefully everybody can hear me with this lapel mic all right. Um, just have to say, I think this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting presentation following Whitman Hospital. I'm going to hopefully draw some, some parallels to sort of the situation that we were seeing in some things this summer and maybe um, some hospitals that are an awful lot like what you have in Whitman County. And maybe we can talk a little bit about how that worked out and maybe things that maybe we should consider for the future. So kind of getting into this, oops, got to go the other way. Uh, my name is Nate Weed. I do work for the state of Washington. So, you know, reduce your expectations by about half at this point. So, um, I serve on a federal emergency response team with U.S. Health and Human Services. And who in here is familiar with the National Disaster Medical System? Okay, a few people. So the National Disaster Medical System was really a Cold War era device um, that was designed to really roll out civilian medical care when the Russians invaded the U.S. and we were having ground and nuclear warfare inside the United States. That's what it was designed for. Um, somewhere around the time of Hurricane Andrew, sometime in the 80s, uh, they started taking on more of an owl hazards role and started doing more disaster response to things like hurricanes. And since then, they've evolved in that role quite a bit. And today, they're much more of a group that you might associate with big hurricanes or large-scale natural disasters. Across the country, uh, these teams uh, train, they get themselves organized, and then at the bequest of the federal government, they go to kind of those crazy places and try to reestablish medical care for the communities that are affected by these events. My role is I serve on what's called their incident response coordination team, which is sort of their incident management team. It's the group that's there to provide command and control, logistics, finance, all those things, for these teams of healthcare providers that are out there doing work in the field. So when I go out the door with stuff like this, I cease to be a state employee and become a federal employee. And under that whole structure, um, it's a little bit different than sort of what we do on a state or local role. But what we're gonna find is that honestly, it all is gonna come back to really this local role. So this, uh, this fall, we had three major hurricanes affect the United States and our territories. Uh, the first one, Hurricane Harvey, came ashore, uh, hitting Texas, primarily a little bit of Louisiana there. Second one came up through Puerto Rico and into Florida and on into Georgia and kind of made a mess of things. Uh, third one came right up through the Virgin Islands into Puerto Rico, on into Florida and back up into Georgia and messed things up pretty much all along the way. Um, this back-to-back -back hurricane thing created some very interesting dynamics in a bunch of respects. I initially got a call as Hurricane Harvey was making landfall. It was mm, just starting to make landfall. And remember, it came in and then stayed, right? 
And they said, well, we need you to deploy to Dallas, Texas. That's a long ways from Houston, but that's okay. So I ended up going to Dallas, Texas, where they thought I was going to be kind of helping manage a staging area, which seemed okay. I mean, that seems like fun. But really, as things ground into Houston, they quickly turned me into a group supervisor and said, okay, you're going to go to Houston and set up a division um, in Houston and run that. So off you go. Um, I will say that it was kind of an interesting trip from Dallas to Houston. The storm was still going. It was still raining. Things were totally flooded out. Uh, we had this full entourage of DMAT teams, and each DMAT team comes with three tractor trailers full of stuff. So we had this convoy that was really, really long. And in there, all these ATF agents who were our security force, which was really nice because we came into Houston. Um, Houston, uh, yeah, Houston Police Department SWAT team was serving warrants in the area that we were trying to occupy. And so that became quite a a festive event in which lots of people put on outfits and I don't know displayed firearms and stuff and kind of helped us get to a place in Houston called the NRG arena so if you're familiar with the Astrodome and some okay this is next door to that it's the building just adjacent so then we did this thing there and uh, got demobilized back to Washington because we had a wildfire going that I kind of needed to attend to. So came back for a week and did wildfires as a state guy, which was kind of good. And then from there went back out to Puerto Rico. But this was for Hurricane Irma. So Hurricane Irma had made landfall and they sent me to Puerto Rico. And this was kind of interesting because really there were some interesting opportunities for advancement in Puerto Rico. Then after Puerto Rico, well, not after Puerto Rico, during Puerto Rico, the next hurricane, Hurricane Maria, made landfall. And as it was making landfall and over our heads, somebody said to me, look, as soon as this thing rolls through, we need you to go to the Virgin Islands and set up a division there. Okay, so I did that. And then deployed to the Virgin Islands and got back to Washington 30 days, 38 days after that. So um, that was kind of my summer vacation in a nutshell. Oops, I'm going the wrong way there. So... Here's the thing about these three storms. We had Hurricane Harvey. We had this Houston experience. This was amazing. In Houston, our division was really, really cool. And the reason it was really cool is we had Harris County Public Health running all of their environmental health strike teams and using a 250 bed alternate care facility. They called it a functional and medical needs shelter on one end of the building. We had the entire FEMA ambulance contract and all of the EMS resources for the state of Texas being dispatched and managed from the other side of the building. We had a US Health and Human Services DMAT team providing emergent care. We had a full federal medical station from the CDC being managed by the state of Texas in concert with BCFS, a non-governmental agency. And we had a full logistics operation with US HHS on the other side, all in one building. This was, this was really, this was cool. Like if I could say this was a cool mission, this was amazing. And this, this is what Dr. Cadillac, the Asper came down to Houston to look at. And when he says right now, we want healthcare coalition to look like Houston, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's referring to is that kind of operation where state, local, federal, non-governmental, the EMS side are actually operating, not just in the same building, but fully integrated in the same building and making it look good, right? Like this was the experience and it was pretty neat. I mean, it felt good to be part of that mission. It felt good to be involved in that. Everybody was pretty pleased with the way things were going. And honestly, it was pretty easy in Texas. Like there were a lot of resources available to us. Resources could come to us in just a matter of hours. And if you needed something, you just asked and it seemed to materialize. Now there was a little time delay because there is an emergency, it's about two days when, you know, on the ground you ask for something and then it goes all the way up the chain and then it comes all the way back. And you know, it's a couple of days, but you get used to that and that's part of the deal, but it was happening. So then I got to go to Hurricane Irma. <clears throat> this is Puerto Rico. Now Puerto Rico has a couple things that make it difficult. First of all, it's 1200 miles out in the ocean. So, when we were leaving Houston and going across the Gulf before I came back, we were noticing something interesting, and it was bucket trucks. Bucket trucks extending two and a half miles, two and a half miles of bucket trucks. What were they doing, you ask? They were simply waiting 
to go into the hurricane affected area to begin restoring power. Here's the deal. When you're in Puerto Rico, you cannot find two miles of road off the island in any direction. It's an island. It's isolated. They simply don't have that. Plus, it's a Spanish colonial island. So you can have a four lane highway cruising along. Everything's good and all of a sudden chokes down to one lane between two buildings that have been there since the 1600s. And there's a bunch of trees and stuff and power lines all stuck between those buildings and now you're kind of stuck. So you have these really interesting infrastructure challenges as you're trying to make things work. And this was, this was really tricky because you're navigating resources that now have to come by ship and take two weeks. So it's not two days anymore, it's two weeks to get a resource. And once you get it here, you got to get it from one part of the island to the other part of the island, which is like a Herculean feat. So this is kind of what we were up against. And it was really kind of a, it was a sort of frustrating experience. I mean, just straight up, it's very frustrating to be responding in that kind of an environment. Now, I will say, you had kind of a couple things going on here. You had certainly the San Juan experience, which was sort of the thing that really you saw on the news. And, and I was kind of involved in a lot of that. And my main mission actually for Hurricane Irma was to identify particularly patients who needed electric, electricity, they were electrically dependent, or dialysis, and basically plan for and aeromedically evacuate them from Puerto Rico. That was, that was really what my job was. And we were relatively successful in this. Like, we had them identified, we got them all there, we got them on a plane, we got them stateside. But it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing, and it certainly wasn't a very clean mission, and it certainly isn't one that I look back on and say, wow, that was totally successful. This was a mission that had a lot of problems associated with it. And the problems compounded in a way that was interesting because we had a C-130 bound for Miami. We had people for the last group that needed to go on a bus and Hurricane Maria making landfall kind of all at the same time. And negotiating these things is a little bit more of a trick when you've got that kind of pressure than we did in like Texas, where it was really pretty straightforward to do some of this stuff. So then the hurricane's standing over us and, and who in here knows Rick Buell? A couple people, okay. Rick Buell is our Region 10, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Idaho, Region 10 lead emergency response coordinator from HHS. He was also in the hotel with me and he was the other guy who was going to be sent to the Virgin Islands. So, the two of us were kind of stuck with this and this was the deal. So we're going down to Hurricane Maria. Now, here's the deal. The mission was in the hotel, as we discussed it, to go to St. Croix, which is where the health department is and the emergency management agency and do an assessment of their healthcare system and come back. And then we would go with a USAR team. So we were gonna go with this USAR team and a small health and medical task force of eight people. And we were gonna go down 48 hours and we were gonna come back. We were gonna go by helicopter, which meant don't pack heavy, like bring your day bag and everything's gonna be good. Okay, we say, well, we get ourselves there, which I'm gonna tell you that wasn't quite as planned. And then, as I mentioned, it was a few extra days of being in the Virgin Islands with the same pair of pants the entire time. So it was pretty interesting because what happened was we got sent down there, but there was literally no logistical backbone to support us. So now we had a challenged logistical background going into San Juan, Puerto Rico, right? But then the logistical background extending out into the Virgin Islands was just non-existent. So we were kind of, as they say, on your own and had to kind of make everything up as we went. So it was truly one of the most complicated and interesting responses I have ever seen. And it was totally game on. Like this, this is disaster response in an austere environment. That's what it is. And in this, one of our major features was really working with a local hospital in St. Croix. This is a critical access hospital. This hospital, in fact, actually looks a little bit like if you took your 1989 picture and your 2009 picture. So two stories like in 2009, but kind of the 1989 vintage there with the lighter color bricks, that's what it looks like. 
offers almost exactly the same package of services. Though I will say, strangely in the Virgin Islands, there's a high need for dialysis. Like this is an interesting feature, like there's a high level of need for dialysis, more so in that population than a lot of others. But if you looked at that and you didn't know where you were, you could say, this is the same hospital. Now here's the deal. The hurricane came through. It entered on one end of the island. It exited on the other end of the island. Kind of like a gunshot wound, actually. Like small hole on the front end, big hole on the back. And the hospital sits exactly in the middle. And so it lost its roof. It also took some damage through its sewage system, which exploded into the ER, which sucks, um, and had some other pretty significant infrastructure damage occurring to it, right? Army Corps of Engineers that came in kind of with that USAR team basically said it's condemned. Like, there's nothing you can do with this. This building is condemned. But we've still got to treat patients. We've still got people coming in the door. We've still got people doing crazy, stupid human tricks with chainsaws, trying to clear debris and trees from roads. And some of them don't really use chainsaws very much. You can tell because they're in the ER with like chainsaw injuries. Um, and so this is, this is the reality, right? What do we do? What is this going to look like? So in short, we spent a lot of time evacuating the hospital. Again, aeromedical evacuation. Now this was really pretty neat because the Air Force came in with some really neat resources to help do this. But those resources were really, really narrowly defined around this mission. So they weren't like resources we could use other ways. So they had that going and we supported that. We did evacuate the entire hospital. We evacuated all the patients off the island who needed dialysis or who were um, electrically dependent. This was part of the deal. But then, then you've got some really, really big questions. You now have a hospital that, again, it could, it could be any critical care hospital in an isolated place with no roof and no power, well, intermittent power, and no real resource backbone to get supplies or to get things brought in, a major sewage leak, so, you know, factor that in had water, had actually potable water. So it had running potable water. This is, this we would have said is a win. Um, looking back on it, I'm like, wow, that was not much of a win, but it was. Um, and most of your staff want to quit. And a lot of them have. Today, by the way, 60% are gone and not coming back. So like, that's kind of where they are. So you've destroyed this, you've evacuated all your patients, you've gotten, you know, now, but you still have people coming in, you still have people getting hurt, you still have people who need medical care. And so this is the mission now, is to figure out how to support that and how to rebuild the health system and how to connect that broken health system with St. Thomas, where they've also got a broken health care system. And the two health care systems are actually one system with two hospitals, but they're on separate islands, which makes it a little tricky. So this is kind of what's going on. And this was, this was where this all came together. And we learned some things. And we learned some things. And really, there's three major lessons that we learned in doing this. The first lesson is that really the local ability to leverage resources is so critical to the success of the mission. And here's the deal. People who've been impacted by a major disaster, a catastrophic emergency like this, a lot of times managing resources is hard to do and when you've been impacted like this now it becomes almost impossible to do and so when we're thinking about how we apply resources in a disaster you've really got to get every single level of responders to act with the right motivation and the right approach because you may have to have a state guy or a federal guy or some weirdo combination of federal state guy that's there, that's not there to help you like find a resource, but simply to talk you off the ledge and help you figure out like, can we talk about managing some resources and how we want to do that and coach and mentor and sort of rebuild a little bit of, you know, hope and, and get people moving in that direction, right? External responders. You know, it's, it, it's funny. I mean, there's a bell curve out there. You've got some that are on the really good end, some that are on the really crazy end, a lot in the middle. But, you know, when I was looking at all three responses, there was a feeling that you got when somebody would come through the door and they would be like, what do I need to do to support you? Like this, this isn't good. What do you need from me? What can I do for you? And actually mean it and actually follow through on it like that. Those kind of responders really, they, they can make it happen versus 
the guys would come in and it's like, wow, oh, your hospital jack. Uh, we're going to put a roof on this. And, uh, oh, wow, we can't put a roof on that. Good luck. And wander off. That happened. That's not a, that's not a joke. That's actually like almost verbatim how somebody came through the door, right? Not good, but happened. And you've got to look at really how you use the local resources. So as responders are coming into an area in mass, they can suck up all your resources really quick, especially if they don't have a logistical support system to support them, right? So this is really the last piece of this, you know, leveraging resources. As locals, got to have some boundaries here, right? You got to have some ability to set some rules around how resources are going to use. Now, ideally, we all get to this place where we have our resources. And in Houston, we had our resources, right? A federal medical station ready to be put together. We've got at least somebody's been okay. So that's all food, water, and cots, and blankets, and sleeping bags, and stuff. People to move it around. Houston was good. You get down to the Virgin Islands on the end of that string, none of that. Instead, it's really having that negotiation with the hospital about, hey, would you mind if we slept in your break room? Because like that might work for us. Half the team is staying at the airport on the conveyor belt, so this will work out. And then the reply is, yeah, but my staff's sleeping in there right now. <laughs> they don't have houses anymore. They don't have. And so then you've got to kind of start figuring stuff out. And the resource pool is very small. But you've got to start kind of thinking, like, what are my boundaries on this? Lesson two. Human factors are way, way more important than processes and plans. Um, funny little story here. We're sitting at a hospital in the Virgin Islands. And there's a conversation going, goes something like, we need a plan for this. Why don't we have a plan for this? Shouldn't we have a plan for this event that's going on right now? I'm sitting there looking at this binder on a shelf that says emergency response plan. Of course, I was dumb enough to point out, well, would that work? Oh, no, that won't work. That's the response plan. That doesn't go for anything that we're dealing with right now. Oh, Okay. And it didn't. I mean, in all honesty, you know, it really, it covered internal emergencies. It covered what happens if we have a fire. It covered, you know, all these little pieces. But now we're talking evacuating the entire facility. We're talking about actually using the facility as a casualty collection point for aeromedical evacuation. We're talking about having to figure out an entirely new way to provide medical care on that island and using that as sort of our base of operations. I mean, this was a whole new deal. And certainly that plan didn't go into any of that. However, the people involved been together at their healthcare coalition. They'd had discussions about some of this stuff. They'd talked about some ideas at one point, And that's what they had to put into practice was that stuff. That was the stuff that they actually had to figure out how to then apply to this situation. And it gets hard because, you know, you think about some of this as people get stressed, as people aren't sleeping, as people aren't eating, as people are eating weird stuff at best when they are eating. And when they're sleeping, they're sleeping on the floor in the corner of a command post where everything's still going on. Things just deteriorate. That ability to communicate, that ability to problem solve, that ability to think critically about what we're doing, it goes straight down the drain. So then... You've got to start thinking about what's the leadership doing here? How are we setting a tone where indeed your safety and your well-being actually does get on the list? Because without that, we're not thinking critically. We're not being creative. We're not coming up with solutions, right? And that's a hard, hard thing to do. How many of you in here have responded to large-scale emergencies before? A few of you. Okay. In those large-scale emergencies, did you ever see anybody who simply said, you know, I think I might go take a break and get some sleep right now because this would be good for our team. It happens so rarely. It's so rare. Like it's a rare, rare thing to see. But you know what? A lot of times that's the right answer. The second to the best answer is what you often see, which is that somebody says to a leader in that situation, you have to go get some rest. You have to get something to eat. We need you to get back together so that you can help us be thinkers. And then start trickling that down through the organization. But in the middle of a crisis, that's not what people think they need to do. And for the first four days, maybe it works. 
Maybe people can hold out that long. Day seven, day eight, they're done. They need something different, right? And it's up to the leadership involved. And when I say the leadership involved, I mean at every single level to actually take that initiative and say, look, we've got to step back from this. We've got to get ourselves taken care of. Once we're there, then we can re-engage with this problem. Because guess what? The problem is so big and it's continuing to get worse no matter what you do. Like, you can take this step back. Yes, it will deteriorate. But you know what? It's already so deteriorated that your eight hours of sleep are not going to make it that much worse. And then really that ability to be self-aware. And we practice this in exercises to some degree, right? We practice this when we do stressful things in, in our life or in our work. But getting to that place where we kind of recognize, you know, I'm not in the position where I can be creative. I'm not in the position where I can be that guy who's standing in that hospital talking somebody off the ledge. But I have to know that I'm not there because I may be the only one who knows I'm not there at that point. And if, if that goes unchecked, well, there's going to be more delay. There's going to be more duration of time for things to, to unravel, right? So some of the pictures here, start at the bottom. You know, this is, this is a, a logs guy. He, these are pallets of water. These are the canned water, the good stuff, not the stuff in the plastic bottles, the Anheuser-Busch water, yeah. Um, and he's just passed out there on top of it. Like that's, that's the reality of that, right? And this is a logs guy. This isn't even an operator. This is somebody who's just trying to get water out to the field location. This is kind of what, I love this. I just, some one one of my team members who was with me on St. Croix had that stuck on their pack. And, and that's it. That's actually like the ethos of doing this kind of response right there. Like you can't just be okay with being in a crisis. You can't just be okay with being in a crappy environment. You can't be okay with not having food water. You've got to actually be like, you know, this is the most awesome opportunity I have ever had to find out if I can do this. And if you can get in that mindset and stay in that mindset, this is what changes from a complete catastrophe to we can actually make this work. But you got to be able to do that. And then you got to bring other people with you when you go, right? You've got to keep convincing everybody around you who's been sleeping on the floor at the airport that this is freaking awesome. Like we've worked our whole lives to get an opportunity to practice what we've been doing and say it with that kind of conviction because in your mind, you're like, holy crap, this sucks, right? Yeah. And you can see, I'm not joking about the airport. Like, that's my sleeping bag up there on the conveyor belt. And Rick Buell is back there with those other guys on the other conveyor belt. Like, we lived at the airport on the conveyor belt. That was the deal, right? Again, trying to avoid pulling those resources away from locals, trying to figure something out, trying to make things work is what this is all about. You end up doing some stuff that's maybe not so bright. Top picture up there. That's us driving through floodwater. And that flood water is coming up over the hood of the car. Like this is not two inches of water, turn around, don't drown. Like we're now having water over the top of the car water. So, you know, <clears throat> this is kind of some of the stuff that you find yourself doing. Now, then you've got to ask, right? Was this a sensible idea? Was this not a sensible idea? What was going on here that made that seem like that was a good idea, right? And so this is where you take a look back and you say, well, were we in a good spot? Now I will say, the guy driving this vehicle, he's a U.S. Um, Fish and Wildlife Services officer who actually has done this a fair number of times. And the guy in the Jeep in front of us is actually with us and spotting for us, right? So this is, we've mitigated a lot of the risk. So this wasn't quite totally crazy, but while it's happening, you really wonder if you've made some poor life choices. But then you get up to the top one. What are we doing this for? Why are we here? What, what's, our, what's our deal, right? Anybody know what that is? Anybody ever been in a NICU before? It's a transport isolate. It is, it is a transport isolate. And we could not get two NICU babies off the island. So we had two NICU babies that were electrically dependent who needed to be evacuated from St. Croix. This was part of the deal. It was late. They had been bagging one of them by hand for almost eight hours. This is not something you ever, ever, ever want to be part of. I will just tell you now. And we didn't have any way to do this. Now, there are people out there in the world who will do good things for people. And if you know how to find them, 
it works out pretty well. Turns out there were a couple of pirates at the airport. Now, by pirates, I'm not using this term as in the total piracy kind of pirate thing. They actually are legitimately MDs. Well, one's a DO, but close enough. And they had previously in their lives been um, Air Force pararescue operators. That's, that's their background, right? And they had gone down to the, the Caribbean because they heard that doing aeromedical work in the Caribbean was the hardest place on earth to make this work and they were gonna do it. They were gonna show everybody this can be done. However, because of the way the FEMA ambulance contract came into play, they became part of the FEMA ambulance contract and were no longer available locally to do the things that needed to be done. This poses a small problem. And to make this happen, they were gonna to have to figure something out with CMS to, to arrange this, right? Well, turns out, again, you go to the right people and in the middle of the night, these guys had somehow managed to round up an aircraft that wasn't damaged. Oh, by the way, I should mention, their whole base of operations and their whole um, business was cut in half by a hurricane or a tornado that spawned off the hurricane the day after we got there. Like this would destroy most businesses. These guys were not bothered by this at all. They had reconstituted their entire operation in 48 hours. And not only that, they had added a CrossFit gym to their hangar. So these guys, they had skills, and part of the skill was where can you find an airplane in the middle of the night that has to fly from here to Miami to get the isolate, fly back here to get two babies, and fly them both back to Miami. And we're not really sure you're gonna get paid for this, right? Well, not only did they make that happen, they brought back McDonald's when they came back. So, I mean, these guys, these guys have it together, I'm just saying. And so this is kind of what you end up kind of doing in these environments. And this is, this is kind of tricky because this goes right into my next piece, which is that adaptive frameworks are absolutely crucial for being successful in these environments. You know, we put so much stock in the plan, the policy, the procedure, right? And for a day-to-day -day operation doing something by the book, it's helpful. It actually adds some consistency. It makes things work. It gives us those checks and balances that our auditors are looking for. It's good stuff. But when it's the middle of the night and you've got two NICU babies and you're bagging one by hand and you don't have an airplane and you don't have an isolate, well, really seriously, do we care? Like, seriously, do we care? Like, hell no, we don't care. Like, that's not even part of the equation anymore. But you know what? There's somebody in Miami who thinks it's part of the equation. There's somebody in San Juan who thinks it's part of the equation. And they're very concerned about how this is going because this does not look like poker according to Hoyle, right? So in here, we've got to really look at how we structure our response policies and procedures and how we don't get stuck on those standard day-to-day -day policies and procedures, which are there for a really good reason. But then there's that time when they're not there for a good reason. They're actually causing problems for us, right? And so, you know, we look at this and we've got to look at our command control structures and that whole chain of command and make sure that people are empowered in that to point out when look I get it like I totally understand why we use this policy and procedure I know why it's here I'm fully supportive of that and right now this doesn't work for us and and people then need to be supportive of that they need to say okay all right we see what's going on you're right that is not the thing we need to do we need to adapt we need to improvise and we need to make this come together in an entirely different way today and in a catastrophic event, that's kind of what we're looking at. You know, plans just don't survive the initial assessment. It's always fun when you go out the door with a lot of like federal people because they love their plans. And they've, they've you know, they've funded these healthcare coalitions, for example, to write plans, right? Like this year, develop your plan. Okay, well, we've done this a couple other years, so it shouldn't be too hard. But, you know, they're going to come in the door with that in their hand, right? Oh, here's your plan. Here's your plan. Well, okay, this is good. But did that plan really cover that one one-off contingency that now has created a catastrophic event? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe when you thought it through as a planning group, maybe something made sense that now today you're going, that, that wasn't it. But being able to adapt to those things are crucial. And then finally, you know, you look at this whole system and if you can't integrate federal, state, local across all the ESFs, you're creating a situation where 
you're not being adaptive. You're not being flexible. You're not being effective. And this is where really, truly, like, this is what gets people killed in some of these big events. This is the reason that you see some morbidity and mortality coming from some of these, these big disasters that should be mitigated. It's because somewhere in the system, somebody decided, well, no, I'm in charge of this and we can't do that for you. Well, what do you mean you can't do that for me? You're 20 feet away and you have a helicopter. Come on, let's make this work. But that can be a showstopper right there. Whereas if you can get everybody on the same page and get everybody moving in one direction, well, now, now lots of things are possible. In fact, way more stuff is possible. And when you're dealing with a catastrophic event where you're truly at that point where now you're on an isolated bit of real estate way out in the middle of nowhere, your hospital has been physically damaged to the point where it's really questionable whether you can actually treat people in it. You're, you're working with some very strange individuals who are willing to hang in there with you and treat patients, even though it may not be in their own self-interest. And they're doing this for some unknown reason, you know, that's when you want to be able to count on the fact that, okay, everybody else will also go there with me. Everybody else involved understands that this is now our reality and that we're all willing to work together. Because at that point, you can lift a lot of stuff if everybody will work together. But when somebody won't work together or when some group is saying, no, 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 we have different priorities, the whole thing can be really easily taken apart. And then all of a sudden, nothing's happening and everybody's trying to do whatever they need to do with their own resources which were clearly inadequate to be addressing their problem right so kind of pictures here again this whoop, this this is actually the texas joint field office this is the esf8 area for the texas joint field office this space is bigger than like the whole State Department of Health Agency Coordination Center. Like if we take out those fake walls that we have and expand it all the way out, like this, this is actually way bigger than ours. And this is just the ESFA people. It's crazy. But when you look at this, you see this board back here and all these stickies? This is actually keeping track of every single federal medical resource that's going out the door and trying to then get from over here where they're basically getting requests from the state plugged in so that they can match the request from the state with the resource and get it to the community where it's needed right like this is what they're trying to do so it's important work but man it's a machine alternatively now you said you guys have a command post that's that's dedicated well this is saint croix they didn't have a dedicated one i love their their this is painted on the wall by the way um, but here we are. This is uh, the incident commander for the hospital, uh, the chief financial officer and attorney for the hospital, um, a physician who was on my health and medical task force, and two uh, mid-level providers. And what they're doing here, and you'll notice that they're doing this on paper, not on a computer, by the way, because, well, <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, they're actually really working out a plan to reconstitute the healthcare system for the Virgin Islands. Like, that's what they're doing. And today, I'm deploying seven people from my agency in King County to go down to implement that plan. I mean, this is, this is real. This is like how this works. That was 90 days ago. So think about that for a second, right? They're writing a plan. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, our folks get on a plane at SeaTac to head to the Virgin Islands to implement that plan been a couple of days what have they been doing since right how do you make that work and really like it's not for lack of trying like these people are not like just hanging out doing nothing because it feels good like this is the pace at which you rebuild things i mean that's something you got to take to heart is that when you have a catastrophic event recovery is not a week it's not a month it's many years of recovery you look at new orleans right now look at charity hospital Ed mentioned from New Orleans, actually worked at Charity Hospital, was in trauma services, their level one trauma center. It's still sitting there as an empty shell to this day. You can go down to New Orleans, go down the street right there, and there is Charity Hospital. Charity Hospital ER saw a million patients the last year I worked there. The ER saw a million patients. I mean, think about that for a second. A million patients, and that building is closed. How many years? 12 years? 
12 years after that hurricane. 90 days is not bad. 90 days is actually not terrible, but it's been 90 days. And think how it feels if you were a hospital in that remote community trying to get by for 90 days with not much. That's part of what we're talking about when we say, you know, healthcare coalitions need to be response organizations. How would you support each other if one of you were in that boat? That's tough. Like, that's really tough. And that's some big asks because it's not, hey, can you come and help me for 72 hours? We got an MOU, you're free for like 72. No, this is 90 days. That's, that's almost a permanent structure, right? This is in the hospital. Um, this, so I just got to tell you, we, we continued to use the hospital. Like even though the Army Corps of Engineers said this place is condemned, you need to get out of here no more. We continued to use it because it was what we had, right? And so what we would do is we had three things that were kind of a problem. The sewage leak. So people would take turns basically mopping up the sewage leak because that was like one of the things you had to do. So you'd mop everything out to keep these exam rooms basically clean. This, this was the plan. The second thing is the surgeons who were no longer doing surgery, but everybody sails in the Virgin Island, like they're all sailors, like they sail boats and stuff. And because it rains every afternoon and it had no roof on the hospital, they had rigged up these tarps as sails. And so as it would rain, they would be upstairs, um, basically trimming these sails to get water diverted out the windows to keep the ER dry. Like that was kind of part of the plan, right? So the surgical staff's up there, sailing, right, diverting rain out windows using these, these tarps and pulleys and ropes. And then downstairs, you've got people mopping out basically to keep this whole area clean. I mean, reeked of Lysol. I don't know where they found so much Lysol, by the way. Like, that was just mind boggling. We could get nothing else, but we had all this cleaning supplies. Interestingly, Kmart next door was finally opening up when we left, and I noticed that they were completely out of cleaning supplies. So we might have been the problem. Um, but in there, yeah, that's kind of what was going on. And this is just Jeff, he's a paramedic. And, you know, this is kind of, again, kind of part and parcel to doing business. You know, this is after the hospital's been closed, we've evacuated the whole place, but, you know, she needed, she needed stitches. I mean, what do you do, right? You're not gonna say no. This was kind of cool. So we got there and there's no communications basically. You can't get cell communication. We burnt up two satellite phones and basically we're, we're stuck. But you know what? They had a landline that worked on the island. So if you were on a landline phone on the island, you could talk to other landline phones on the island. You just couldn't get off the island. And so we actually coordinated the patient evacuation and the aeromedical evacuation at the airport with the hospital from the payphone. And it worked actually pretty well, but uh, it was a little strange that we were using the pay phone, which, you know, we switched out. We found a phone that didn't take quarters and rewired it. And so far we haven't been sent a bill yet, which is kind of nice, but uh, that was kind of how we did it. But the thing I loved about this the most is, you know, operating principles are something that I hang up in my command post every time I activate. And these were already on the wall. And I think this was, this was where everything kind of clicked, right? Is it the truth? Is it fair for all concerned? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better relationships, right? This was, this was our operating principles from day one. Here we are at the airport, this is where we live now, and here's our operating principles. Welcome to, welcome to doing a catastrophic incident in an austere environment. And we really did actually like not have extra clothes. Like we were all wearing the same clothes like the entire time we were there and it was really bad. But like I said, the Kmart opened the last day and everybody got to buy new socks and underwear. It was a huge experience. Everybody was so excited. I will also say like it wasn't actually that bad for the whole time because really there was a cruise ship that came in to serve as a base camp for all of the responders after about seven days. So once we got to seven days, we at least had some place with running water and food and things like that. But, you know, we think about just how all of this is coming together, and I've kind of mentioned this. As a state, we've got to figure out how to do that Houston model. And it doesn't have to be the Houston model, but, man, that ability to coordinate across all those parts of the health and medical system and all the way vertically from local to federal. I mean, that's what we've got to be able to do and make it kind of click. 
we got to make sure that our organizations are building responder adaptivity, right? We've got to make sure that like, if, if a healthcare coalition is going to be a responder organization, what are we doing to build the responders themselves? Because we can build lots of systems and plans, but we've got to invest in the people that actually have to do the work because they're the ones that are going to be out there saying, oh my God, this isn't going to work. I need to come up with a new plan and it's the middle of the night and I haven't really eaten all day and tomorrow's not looking like a good day, right? We've got to build those administrative frameworks that can adapt when we're not dealing with the routines. And this is, this is certainly as a state person, like one of our biggest things is what do we need to do to make that adaptivity in our policies and our procedures? Because man, as the state of Washington, you know, how many beds you got, <laughs> right? And that's a tough lift. Like that's a tough lift. It shouldn't be, but it is. And so this is what we've got to work on. And then for catastrophic events with communication system failure, we got to make sure that we feel good about allowing response at every level. You can't start getting real picky about how things are going to get done because there's enough for everybody to do. And if people just start doing work, eventually, eventually you can get it all coordinated. But initially, you've got to let people really get out there and do what they need to do. And whether that's at a hospital or that's, you know, out in the field at an EMS facility that's maybe you know surrounded by earthquake debris and can't even get to a hospital I mean whatever it is those are the pieces that need to be put in place so real quick disclaimer I do this presentation kind of surfing back and forth between two roles um, because I really do have like this federal hat there's some things that we just kind of have to let go by a little bit on these uh, if you want to catch me on that later I can certainly uh, fill you in and then, you know, really, I do reserve the right to add pirates to these slides at any point because, well, that was fun in St. Croix, all that. So if you do have questions, um, oh, that's weird. Anyway, uh, Nathan.weed at doh.wa.gov. Travis and everybody does have my contact information and feel free to shoot me an email and call or whatever. Thoughts or questions? Travis, anything on GoTo? What's that? Perfect. Just checking in. All right. Nate, thank you very much. Yeah. The goal in my life is never to have to do that. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs>